I started go-go dancing at a local nightclub, and just I was at a different club every night. But that was our thing. I was a little club kid, a little raver, and that's just just what I started doing. And but it was during this time um, that I was um, out at a local night nightclub here in Knoxville, and I was approached by a group of older women. And you know, this is everybody's story. It's been in the industry, whether trafficked or not, and even being trafficked is, is different. Everyone's story is so unique, and I think what's different about, about mine is that, you know, I was recruited by women because I think people don't think that can happen. Uh, but I was approached by a group of older women. They were, like, early 30s, and they just began to shower me with compliments, you know, about how good-looking I was and how good I danced. And, you know, you can make a lot of money dancing. And, you know, we're the, we're feature entertainers for clubs, and we, we travel and we get paid to dance and um, we model. And they're talking about all this stuff, modeling, dancing, um, and traveling, getting paid all this money. And I'm sitting here listening to this, and they're just, like, you know, showering me with these compliments and, for someone like like you were saying, never feeling I belonged anywhere, not really ever having any girlfriends, um, you know, just feeling very alone and isolated. This it just felt really good. Like, hey, these chicks want to hang out with me. They're you know making me feel really good about myself, talking about all this money I can make, and and you know I'm sitting there. I just went through a very um, traumatic event in my life. Um, the, the loss of my father, which the way it all went down, it was just extremely traumatic. And so, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm depressed, I'm lonely, I'm wanting an escape from my life anyway. And basically what what they were baiting me with, it sounded good. And I took that bait. And it ended up being a bait and switch tactic, basically. So this is our building. It used to be a brothel called Angela's Days Ball, and uh, it had women trafficked from Thailand uh, for prostitution here. The first part is ancient myths of sex trafficking. So it goes over Babylon, so Babylonian brothels, the way that women would have to go that there as a stranger would come and cast money into her lap and have sex with her. Um, usually surrounded about Baal and Asherah. Greece, different worshiping sites in Greece where they saw similar things. Rome, they actually had currency based around sexual positions in Rome. And they're so pornographic that we had to show this one that was old and decrepit. They actually have really, really well attacked ones, but they're just so graphic we couldn't put them in the museum. Um, and then Pompeii, this is a brothel in Pompeii that really reminds us of that room over there. Um, just, uh, so, um, this is really important to show people that it isn't just a new thing. And in here, we introduce what the um, abolitionists call the white slave trade, which is another word for sex trafficking. Um, the beginnings, you know, Industrial Revolution made it really easy for it to happen. Um, and then this is kind of the beginning of when they started calling it the white slave trade. These are kind of posters that people put out um, explaining what it is. And um, like these were like awareness posters back in their time. You know, held in white slavery, will you help her set, set her free, different things like that. Um, this talks about government regula regulated prostitution and where it happened in different countries. So everything up to now is really just talking about the issue of sex trafficking and how it's kind of changed in culture. But this is where we introduce the abolitionists. And this is like my favorite board, because these are my heroes. 
um, William Booth, Catherine Bushnell, Donaldina Cameron, Josephine Butler, W.T. Stead, and Bramwell Booth. Um, just really incredible people. Yeah, and this is actually some old original copies of um, the War on the White Slave Trade. And so a lot of the pictures that are out here were originally in this book. Um, These are replicas of telegrams. Uh, this is talking about Josephine Butler. She was kind of like the grandmother to all of the different um, abolitionists. She kind of really wrote out so many different. Um, so there's every room in the museum has quotes by Josephine Butler because she's a grown. <laughs> She understood the purity movement behind fighting sex trafficking in a way that I don't think any of the others like communicated as well. Oh, this is the thing. See how everybody's working together? Oh yeah. I might need to look at it, you know, and then we can come back to it if you want to put it down and let you look at it, but. We found this in sign of a, a Salvation Army book, but it shows every, like if you look close, it says, sorry, I just moved this up to you, just, the farm colonies, the workmen, the um, homes for children, poor man's lawyer, home for the homeless, slum crusades, and then out here you see like different, all everything, carpentry, um, bakeries, shelters, everything, everybody. And you see the different women and men working around the top, and then this is where they get the people. We're in the stormy seas of whatever, and they're helping them out, and then they're pulling them out, and then you see the trails leading them back into society. And everybody's working to combat mm -hmm. slavery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And darkest England and England in the way out. started, my, my demise and self-sabotage started, and I was raped at 16 years old, and um, my mother was with an extremely racist man, and he put me out because of who hurt me, and he said that I brought it on myself. The problem was is that wasn't true, but he turned his back, and because my mother was very dependent, she told me I had to leave. And so I'm homeless, and I have nowhere to go. And now I've got people, because the guy who did this to me was the salutatorian of our high school class, I had people saying that I was out to um, just shame him. It wasn't true. But then the school turned their back on me. So I'm homeless, and I'm alone. I don't have a support system. Now what do you do? And so I started clinging to guys. And that was just the validation. I became extremely promiscuous. And I just looked for anybody who would just say, I love you for right now. It was not a, a I love you forever. I never, it was just, I didn't understand fairy tales. Nothing was real. And um, I ended up finally graduating high school. And I befriended this one girl. And uh, she just seemed to be the coolest chick I'd ever known. She um, would be there to get my hair done and got my nails done and would buy me clothes and she would introduce me to all her friends and guys would hand her keys to their car um, all the time and I, I just thought that was amazing how anybody could I mean because she didn't appear to be sleeping with anybody I didn't understand and people would give her money and I'm like this is just one cool chick and I didn't understand she would take me all over we'd go um, downtown Chicago we'd go all over the place and she'd pay for everything and I'm just thinking this is cool not only was I dancing in a club, but 
I found out that the way you make your money is actually in the back rooms of these clubs doing what they call private dances. And I'm kind of thrown into this whole situation here and feeling really just coerced and pressured and manipulated. What was I going to do, run out the front door of the club in freaking Memphis? Like, <laughs> I was scared to death. So here I am, and they're kind of, you know, showing me what to do and everything and uh, just kind of pressuring me. And, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go back here and do this private dance so I'm thinking okay you know this is my first private dance I'm thinking okay I'm just gonna go back to the room with this guy and I'm just gonna take off my clothes in front of him and dance in front of him for a few minutes so this song's over and get my money I'm out of here like I just thought okay just just go freaking do it you're stuck down here you have a car just go get it over with get your money just do it and you'll get back home um so I get back there, and basically, you know, my very, very first um, dance, quote-unquote dance, um, I was sexually assaulted. I was born in Noonan and raised in Carrollton in Atlanta. Um, my father went to prison the first time I was three months old. I learned how to read on the back of a prison uniform at 18 months old. Um, he died in prison two years ago. Uh, he was in and out four different times throughout my life, and this last time I knew it was a death sentence. But I, it was just me and my mother. I'm my mother's only child. And at 12 years old, I started running away. And the very first time I ran away, I was in Carrollton, Georgia, and I wound up in Birmingham at 12. Um, between 12 and 15, I ran away many times. Um, there's a couple of things that when I speak and give my story, I always want people to understand. Number one is we're blaming our children for their behavior as opposed to looking at what's going on in their lives. Healthy children from healthy homes don't run away and healthy people don't use drugs. Drugs are not the problem when it comes to prostitution or any of the sex trafficking industry. Drugs are a symptom of the problem and I'll explain what I mean by that. And prostitution and the adult entertainment and that includes strip clubs and pornography are never, ever, ever choices, ever. Even if she looks at you and says, it's my choice, she's in denial. She does not know she's lying, and it is not her choice. She doesn't feel worthy of anything else. Little girls don't grow up and say, excuse me, I want to swing around a pole. That's not weird. There, things happen, that, that happens. Um, so to give you some of why it was so easy for me to, because my first pimp I knew was a pimp, and it's the last time I ran away when I was 15. Um, but prior to that, the system, everyone had failed me. So the first time I ran away, they locked me up for 72 hours. My mother got me out, um, took me to my social worker, and my social worker looked at me at 12 years old and said, when was the last time you had sex? Well, the week before I had been raped for the first time. And so I knew something was wrong with me. And because I didn't physically fight them off, it made it consensual in my mind that I submitted to it. It was my fault. Um, 12 year olds can't consent to sex. And what God has really done in my life to bring help me heal is I have a, my youngest is 15, and so he's really used her, and her name is Erica, and like, could Erica consent? I'm like, well, no. And he's like, well, what do you think you could have? So um, that social worker failed me. Then I continued to run away, but what they were focusing on was my behavior as opposed to what happened in my life. Um, a judge looked at me at 14 years old and said, you're incorrigible. And I said, what does that mean? He said, there's no hope for you. Um, they put me in a psychiatric ward, about 13 or 14, for 17 days for a psychiatric evaluation, trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, I, I attempted to run away one time. My mother caught me. She beat me with a sawed-off broom handle, duct taped my ankles and wrist, and my social worker applauded her. And they locked me up, stripped me nude to take pictures of me because I had bruises from the back of my neck to the bottom of my ankles from the physical abuse she had just instilled on me. But it was my fault. They were blaming me. Based off the name Safe Harbor, I assume it's about protecting victims and sex trafficking people if they, you know, like a immunity law. I'm going to show you the states that have Safe Harbor laws. Draw that right there. Let's see which ones do. Let's see how many more don't compared to how many that do. Yeah, wow. Well.
And after saying that, um, does it surprise you to see how many states don't have these laws? Definitely. prostitutes work of their own free will. I'm sure there's inst instances where they do and there's instances where they do not. I'm sure some do, but not for good reasons. Uh, drugs, stuff like that. And uh, mostly no, I don't think so. I was born in a town, Little Rock, Arkansas, and I moved to Memphis when I was 14 years old. Um, growing up in the projects, really, we really didn't have much. My mom had five kids. She was a single parent. I later learned that men enjoyed being with me once I started having sex, and I, they'd give me money or little rings, or food, or whatever, take me on dates. So as I got a little older, I needed to take care of myself and my daughter. So I founded a massage parlor in Memphis. And I thought I was gonna be doing massages and modeling lingerie, but it was a real private brothel. Guys would come in and pick a lady, and we dressed in lingerie. And I was probably about 23 or 24 years old. And my first client that came in picked me, and we went to the back and we talked. And I sat in his lap and he gave me $200 and that was it. I think he was in and out in 10, 15 minutes. And I fell in love after that. Slowly, I had to learn, we had to do more. Cater to fetishes, uh, all type of little things. So over the years, I branched out and became independent. I even had my own little side businesses with ladies working for me. Um, I've tried to save girls who was in, caught up in the pimp life and didn't have anywhere to go, trying to rescue them too throughout my years. But um, I continue to do it. The money's good. I love the men. I'm single, so I have no guilty conscience. Um, I'm, I'm safe in everything I do. I have regular clients I see. And I'm just hoping one day I can get rich and <laughs> quit. There was this back section that was terribly creepy. Um, back here. This was the shower area and so sometimes they would bring the men back here in one of the many showers or steam rooms so they would take off their clothes so if they thought they were a police officer. Um, you know they can't cover a wire if you're, if you're not wearing any clothes. And um, there's a lot of rules as far as undercover how far you can go. So they would kind of see if they were willing to get um, undressed. The one thing I hate about this business is the pimps. They mess up everything. I've seen girls lose their kids, their life, their family, doing everything, risk, you know, risking their body and everything just to give the money to a pimp that'll beat them and feed them drugs and whatever. They kidnap these girls, they take them all across the country and just use them up and abuse them. So every time I ran across a girl who even told me they had a pimp, I talk to them and I try to persuade them to leave that life alone. I've had girls call me 2 o'clock in the morning telling me they, they left and they need a ride. You know, um, I, I never ran across minors in this business, but I, I ran across mother and daughters, even at the Bunny Ranch, that had the same pimp. They took time sleeping with this guy. They competed on who makes the most money to get his attention. So I've seen pimps take a girl whole life insurance policy and blow it away after she already worked all her life for him. I've, I've heard pimps kill their girls and just beat them. So I never had any respect for that at all. I mean, if we're the one putting our life on the line doing all this, we should be the one to reap the benefits, not give it to a sorry man or there's some female pimps too out there. You know, it's not worth it. So I don't, I don't, I never liked it and I wish they could do something about it because it's not gonna stop, prostitution is not stopping, but they need to regulate a little, a little bit more better and put some more laws, you know, make it a little more strict, stricter. That's it.
say you, you said you tried to like rescue girls or yeah, something. Uh-huh. How would you go about that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I run into them at working in massage parlors. Yeah, and we'll just you know get sit around and talk. And it was a lot in this business, even at the Bunny Ranch. A lot of pimps. They, that's where they put their girls to work, and they send their money back home to them. With, you know, being honest, and they they get beat if they don't you know make the right amount of money. And it's just sad hearing a story. So I try to you know confide in them, let them know I'm here for them. You know, <clears throat> they needed help. I try to contact their family. You know, because a lot of the girls got kids they hadn't seen. The state took them away. And they, all their parents raising them, and it, it hurts them. When they, it hurts me to hear them talk about it. So, so it was while I was working at a club in Memphis that one of my friends approached me. She knew that I was um, staying in hotels when I traveled to work, and um, at, at this point in time, I was no longer um, with my traffickers. I had gone back to work on my own. And so I was staying in hotels when I traveled, and she knew this, and, and she invited me um, to come and stay with her and her boyfriend, which at this time, I, I didn't understand how pimping and trafficking and, and all of this worked, but it, this is when I really got to see the underbelly of this exploitive industry. Um, you know, I, I thought, I was so naive, and I thought that, oh, well, she just, Okay, so her boyfriend's like 50 and she's like 21 and she's young and beautiful and he's old and okay. But I thought, well, he must just be a really nice guy because he's always at the club watching her, making sure she's okay. Or if he's not there, some of his friends are, so they must really care about her. And so when she invited me to stay with her, um, I just thought it was so caring of them because they, you know, escorted us out of the club and and followed us back to um, his house and (laughs) but I quickly began to realize things were that there was something I was missing when when we got there is a really bad neighborhood one of the worst if not the worst neighborhood but one of the worst neighborhoods in Memphis Tennessee and we get there and the whole house is barred up the windows the door everything and there's not even like a doorknob or anything on the door he opens it like he's got the key around his wrist and he he has to open it with that key nobody else has that key and so the guys are like escorting us in and i'm still thinking kind of like okay well they're really nice making sure we're even okay from the car to the door you know and um but then i did think it was weird about the door but i thought okay well it must maybe because it's a really bad neighborhood but we get there and um to really make a long story short over the next few days I was staying there what I saw was just crazy they were they made meth out of that house and sold it through the window um some of the girls would you know they they make it and they sell it and um, there was a girl there who was a runaway she was a minor she was locked up and kept in a back room she was being sold for fifteen dollars fifteen dollars guys playing cards and there was music going and I didn't think anything of it and um, he started just telling me how beautiful I was and and he asked me to come sit by him and he offered me a drink and I'm you know I'm underage but I'm thinking well I don't want to tell him I'm a square and since my dad was an alcoholic I thought this would be no problem Um, and he says oh you're a big girl huh I said please I'm growing I could drink you under the table and I started turning into a lie Um, Anybody who has to paint themselves up and to drink to be a person to be accepted, that's not who they are in the beginning, and I found that out the hard way. And I got into a drinking contest with him, and um, it it just seemed to go on forever, and I decided, well, this is not getting me anywhere, and I wasn't drunk. I didn't know. I'd never drank before, so I didn't know the effects of alcohol, and um, I went to the restroom, and I passed out in the bathroom. 
And when I woke up, I had two dozen used condoms all over me. And I was so sick. And I crawled into the living room and there was nobody there. The furniture was gone. There was furniture when I was in there before. Um, I didn't go to the bath, uh, bedrooms or anything like that, so I didn't notice that it was all set up. So I went looking for my friend and she took off in my car. And when I got back to the apartment that her and I shared, she had a mound of brand new clothes. And she had a bunch of money and I couldn't figure out because she didn't have a job. So where'd all that money come from? And so when I start questioning her about it, she says, oh no, it's just a coincidence. I just had a little extra money stored and I just went shopping. But you took off in my car. And women have a pack. If we go somewhere together, we leave together. That's why we always go to the bathroom together. It's just a pack that's never broken. And even if a girl is going to hook up, we're waiting until that's over before we leave. We never leave our girl. But she left me there. And I asked her, why did you leave? And she said, you asked me to. There's no woman on the face of this planet that's ever going to say, just leave me with some random strangers alone in their right mind. And um, I was so sick. I, uh, for three days, I was just constant vomiting. I should have went to the hospital, but I'm underage. I'm scared. I'm thinking I'm going to be arrested for underage drinking. Uh, I didn't know who to turn to. But when I, a few days later, when I start trying to recall what all took place, I, I realize I can't picture anybody's face. I can remember all the si the sounds the smells, I can see the clothes they had on, I can see where things are placed in that apartment. I cannot see any of the faces. So if I do go to the police, who am I going to describe did this to me? They're not gonna believe me anyway. So I didn't. And what has taken place more and more is how much I regret not going at least attempting. Um, and it ended up happening to me a couple more times you know, but I didn't realize what it was. She asked me to go to another party uh, a few weeks later, and I'm like, no, there's no way. I'm not going anywhere. And she's like, no, it's just a bunch of us girls going to hang out and play cards. And I'm like, okay, chicks I can handle. I didn't dress up. Uh, my hair's in a ponytail. It just go. And I'm walking in real scary looking, and um, it's just women. So I thought I was safe. I could smell hot wings going, I could, you know, the music's going, I was okay. Um, about an hour after we were there, the sound that will never leave me is the banging on the wall. I mean, just that banging on that door. It was on the door. And two guys walked in there, and she set us up. And they, they walked in and started having us parade up and down the hallway, me and these other girls that are there, talking about how much we were gonna, how much we were going to start charging for sexual services. And I'm like, I am not that girl. I don't know what you came here for, but I'm not the one. And they're like, oh, you are now. And they wouldn't let me leave. The other girls seemed to apparently be okay with it. Nobody was freaking out. I'm freaked out. I am not that girl. I've never been that girl. So how did I end up in that place at that time? So. I would go home and my cl I would shower and change and then I'd go back to my shirt and it would smell like a brothel. It would smell like this place and I was what is the smell of a brothel? Oh gosh, I don't know. It was like, it wasn't even like, there was a little bit of the nasty sex smell, but it was a lot of just unkept, like, this whole building was just like the girls, they were just neglected. So there was a smell of like neglect, mold, mildew. Um, then there was a lot of incense that were here, and food that wasn't taken care of. There was also crack pipes, and so it was this mix of musty, um, uh, just just something like a back closet of an abandoned house would smell like. It was just disgusting. And every once in a while when it gets really hot, if I walk past the doorway, I'll, I'll smell it just a little bit again. But for the most part, um, we try to keep the building really clean so that it will never smell like that again. <sighs> Y'all are from Nashville. Um, Antoinette Welch is the DA there. She is fabulous. Um, Y'all have a John school in Nashville. 
there's a 5% recidivism on John School. And what a John School is, is when men are arrested attempting to purchase sex, they're made to go to this one day training, they have to pay for it, and some of the money goes back into victim services in the Nashville area. But those men are able to see what their, what their actions are actually doing. You would have people who try to snatch you up, um, just trying to be physically aggressive with you. And of course, you know, as an officer, I tried not to get ever that close to a vehicle or let them get too super close to me if they walked up to me on the street because of the danger. And prostitutes are murdered a lot. Um, you know, they're beat up a lot, they're raped a lot. So it's a very dangerous situation to put yourself in. with sex workers are, is real. Um, according to, there was a research done by Urban Institute last year. Um, they had taken seven cities and Atlanta was one of them. They looked at the years of 2003 and 2007. I believe it was um, between 56 to 58 percent of sex workers experienced violence. 36% experienced violence from their clients. Um, we had a, a, a woman that our street outreach was ministering to on an ongoing basis within the past month was murdered by three Johns. They beat her and shot her. She died nameless. Her name wasn't in the newspapers. Her story wasn't ever written about. The only people who knew her name were the women who worked with her on the track and those who were ministering to her. Um, there is a major problem with women who pimps use um, as a, a threat of violence so that they don't leave. And it's not that uncommon in cities like Atlanta and smaller cities um, like Macon, Georgia, where if a woman tries to leave, they're thrown in the back of a trunk and they're never seen again. And they are made um, as a reminder to other women who try to leave. You remember Star, you remember so-and-so who tried to leave, where did she end up? Um, so women in the sex industry are not seen as human beings, there's no humanity there. Um, they're seen as objects, they're treated as trash, they're treated lower than what some people would treat their family animals. The Johns are able to, many of them are married, they have families, they have, they have family animals, you know, and they would never treat um, their loved ones the way that they treat these women. They, they see them as, um, just objects. It's like they are able to release their innermost desires onto these women and they don't have to think at all about the consequences. They don't think about um, the terror that they're putting these women through, the pain, the emotional and physical pain. They're just human garbage, human garbage fins. I can recall two of my most horrible experiences in this business, and both of them was with an African-American man. Um, one of them was with an uh, escort service I worked for. He sent me to this guy's house, and I had my driver out in the yard waiting, and he didn't want my driver to sit in his driveway because of his neighbors. He said he wanted, he wanted his neighbors to know what was going on, and my driver refused to leave like he made a block when he came right back and I'm glad he did. By the time I got inside the guy's house, I told him to, you know, where's my payment before we get started? And he was like, it's in the back room. I'm like, go get it. He's like, okay, come on in. He locked the storm door. And I looked over at the couch and I saw a knife handle between the couch cushions. And he looked at me, grabbed the knife, and came 
at me and said, bitch, I'm gonna kill you. And all I could think about was my, my child, my family, me not seeing them, seeing them anymore, and I started hollering and screaming and praying to God, Lord, please don't let me die, don't let me die like this. And he came at me and I was in the corner by the window, just screaming and hollering and praying. And he was just swinging at me. And I don't know, all I saw was black smoke or something just coming at me. And I just ran, he stopped and threw the knife down and just, he ran and my driver ran in and chased him. But I just paused and looked at myself. I'm looking for blood to be coming out of my body from him stabbing at me. But the only place I was stabbed at was in, um, right here on my leg. So I was thankful for it. I ran out the house screaming and hollering. And due to the fact I was young and I felt like I was in the wrong for what I was doing, I didn't even call the police that time. I was just thankful I got my purse and I got out of there safe. My name is Kelly Alsobrook, and I am a talk show host for Ashes to Beauty Talk Radio. And our topics for um, every Tuesday night are human trafficking, where we bring on either survivors of human trafficking or human trafficking organizations that are actually doing something in the movement and you know trying to bring restoration and healing and rescuing of human trafficking victims. So I went through trafficking in my early 20s. Um, I was trafficked for almost five years. Once, I've gotten, once I got out of that life, I, um, I kept quiet about it for over 20 years. I tried to live a normal life, whatever normal may be, and, um, but I was always dealing with this guilt and shame and of the life that I chose. Um, I had no idea and I didn't know anything about human trafficking and then <clears throat> I was good friends with our state representative and a woman came her name is Kimberly and she does a lot with human trafficking and bringing awareness and bringing restoration helping restore victims and so she was talking about Backpage and she was talking about human trafficking and I pulled her to the side and I said you know, I said, could you tell me a little bit more about trafficking? I said, because I don't think I understand. My perception was that it was a third world country issue and not something that happens here. And certainly it wasn't an issue where, you know, the person made the choice. So Kimberly asked me a, ser a series of questions and um, she said, Kelly, this was not a choice you made. And I said, yeah, I did. Um, this was a choice I definitely made. She said, no. She said, you were actually a victim of human trafficking. And I can't tell you the relief almost that I got because for so long I lived in so much shame and I would never tell anybody what I used to be because I was so ashamed. And so what happened is uh, we went to the Women's Caucus up in Nashville and we were talking about how important the healing is for victims once they come out because if not they're going to just keep going back if they don't heal they don't think they're good enough to be in society at least that was the case for me and so that was the very first time I shared my story was in front of the women's caucus um, and once that was over and I was driving back I was in tears because it was time I had shared it and um, it was like a release for me being able to talk about it because I had always been in so much shame how could I tell anybody you know the life that I used to live um, but I was praying all the way back to Memphis and I said God 
I promise you that until my dying breath, I will share my story if it will help someone else. And so that's how all of this came about for me to start speaking up and speaking out about human trafficking. Introduced to the strip clubs and she then went with a pimp. They went to Washington, D.C., and there was apparently a serial killer. Um, and so, no, I will never see her again because she got in his car and um, he slit her throat. The sad part about things like that, when crimes happen, when murders happen with um, anyone that's just so like prostitute or you know this is who they are this is their life this is what they want to be um, is if anything happens I can't tell you the countless times that I have been taken and um, raped beaten but you can't go to the police they say oh well that's just a part of your job isn't it that's just isn't that a, a, a something for your trade? You know, so we're already beaten down before we even get involved. We're already beaten down. And then we have this, um, this pimp that is just manipulating with the mind games and beating us and beating our messing with our minds and beating us physically. Then we have the Johns that feel like they can do anything to us because we're lower than dirt. And that's not the case. We're not lower than dirt. I look at them as lower than dirt because Johns are just as bad as the traffickers. Who purchases a person for sex? There is an issue there and it's a matter of the heart. There have been times and cases that young girls are in a hotel room. Um, Yvonne Williams from Trafficking in America Task Force talked about two young girls that were underage in Nashville for 10 days. Um, and I think they each saw about 100 men in those 10 days. And they told each and every one of them we are not, we're here against our will and we're underage. Not one of them did anything to help them and they still wanted their services. So when it comes to prostitution, trafficking, whatever anyone wants to call it, we're labeled as trash and that we can be treated any kind of way and there's no consequences. So if someone, if a prostitute is murdered. Think the police are going to do anything? I don't know. They're not going to look as hard for who killed that person, and it and was a person, and um, versus maybe a basketball player or you know a mom, a single mom, or a guy who's working hard because we were considered lower than dirt, and they still think of women that way and I tell people all the time whenever you see someone who's in prostitution or in the strip clubs or um, uh, with porn don't judge them because you don't know how they got there and that's the sad part with our society today is that they do judge and they do think that we're lower than dirt and crackheads and oh she's just a crackhead and she needs to do this or that just to get a hit. You don't know that. You don't know what happened to her or him. So. So at 15 I ran away for the last time um, and I met my first pimp and I knew he was a pimp but there was no other choice. I mean everyone already failed me. I had been in group homes. I had been in a foster home but I had been in every shelter um, group home there was in Georgia and some of them wouldn't take me back because, and I've been locked up so many times um, so he I knew he was a pimp and he took me home and there were two girls um, that worked the streets and there were two girls that worked strip clubs and so I made the fifth girl and I was the youngest and I think the oldest she was about 21 22 um, and what he had me doing at first was selling drugs 
And he said, but the entire time he's teaching me about cocaine and I'm going out every night and selling them, he's saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't ever use it, don't do drugs. I mean, he's instilling that in me regularly, don't do it. Um, but I, I'm 15 and I'm not having to do what the other girls are doing, so I think he loves me more. Um, we're having family meetings. Everyone has a quota. The family pulls together. You have sister-in-laws or wife-in-laws or whatever you want to call them. Everyone has a different name. It, I mean, they go back and forth between the names, but we're family. And when you don't make quota, um, and it's, you don't even know everyone's quota, he tells you your quota. I mean, I never knew the other girl's stuff. But if you don't make quota, punishment doesn't happen in private. Punishment happens in front of everyone, whether it's a beating or a brutal rape by him or friends or whatever. You know it's punishment. And so um, you make quota. And so one particular night, he sends me out to sell drugs and he drops me off and there's not enough drugs to make quota. And so I knew the tables had turned. At 15, I physically submitted to selling myself because I didn't want to go home and get beaten. It was still rape. It was about two days before I started using those drugs. And what God has shown me recently is I didn't even, I mean, it was literally about six months ago. And it didn't click until then that I was selling drugs to the other girls on the streets. I did not make the connection then to understand what had happened. So did it become a vicious cycle of drug use? Absolutely, but if you're getting raped 30 times a day, you're gonna get high on something too. Um, so she doesn't have a drug problem. She's got a drug symptom. There's a deeper core problem. And so um, I got caught not too long after that and they locked me up again and then they put me in a home in Georgia um, I skipped high school and started college and at 16 I was accepted into college at 15 and they put me in a dorm at 16 and within about six weeks of being in the dorm I was back on the streets um, because I was already worthless I was no good in my own brain and they'd emancipated me at that time so there was no need for me to run away in other words because since they had put me in college they had to make sure I was an adult by law and so the system had emancipated me and so I didn't run away anymore and I went back to that pimp. And at that point we started traveling across the United States being sold. And like I'd said before, I've been sold in every state but Alaska and Hawaii and Canada and Mexico. And then in 97... How does, how does that work? I mean, well, you, from... you don't go from big city to big city. That's what people think. It might take you two days to get from Atlanta to Birmingham because you're sold at every single exit. There's men that are purchased sex at every single exit. So how does... How does it... How does the pet find these people in a situation like that where you're going exit to exit? Um, I can take you off just about every exit and show you where the girls are. They're taken. Whether it's truck stops, rest areas, a store, an apartment complex, or just an area of town. Now the way that things happen now with the internet is just so much easier. The only thing you got to do is post an ad and say this is the area I'll be in. And people respond to it. Do you call those ads and speak? I don't. Mm -hmm. So um, that was about 11 years. Yeah, I was bought and sold, traded. Uh, like I said, I was given away one time by a pimp. And one of the worst pimps I ever had, which is called a gorilla pimp, they were the ones that beat you into submission. Um, I've been beaten so much, my face doesn't bruise anymore. This portion of my face has no feeling in it. And I mean, that was from a straight razor on my neck. Um, this was a hole. That scar there, that looks just like a bump, that was a hole through my lip where I dove out of a two-story window onto a gravel um, driveway, just like you would dive into a swimming pool um, to escape him. My pimp told me some truths, my first pimp. He told me that I would be arrested and he would not. And the first time I was arrested, I was 16. I was booked into the jail, taken to the mattress room and raped by the officer who took me in the mattress room. Uh, I've had enough bruises on my chest from having sex with men with bulletproof vests on and the vest actually bruising me. So when I train law enforcement now, I show them, like for the first 10 minutes, I physically shake from the PTSD because of the abuse that they've put on me. And the abuse that's happened. I mean, I was handcuffed to a tree and raped by law enforcement, handcuffed in the back of the car and raped, and then let go. Because the mindset is you can't rape her or kill her. I mean, four friends of mine were decapitated in my early 20s and no one ever researched it. Law enforcement didn't even look into it because all the girls were the ones who worked the streets. So, um, in saying all of that, the ties are like across the board.
does not receive sexual services, we think he should have a right uh, to demand them if he's paid for them. Um, no. Okay. He does not have a right to demand. Do you think it would something like that qualify as rape? Demanding or actually following through with uh, forcefully on the business transaction? Second. Uh, no. Let's say a man hires an escort, does not receive sex in the interaction. Um, does he have a right to demand it if he's already paid? Yes, no. 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 Okay, do you think that forcing in that case would be the same as rape. Yes. Yes. The first thing is, is to make sure people understand the difference between prostitution and human trafficking. Prostitution is not human trafficking. Forced prostitution is. Forced sexual labor. Um, things that are um, coerced. Um, now, that does not mean also it's very important to get people to understand that um, if a person gets into prostitution by choice that it cannot turn into trafficking later. It most definitely can. Um, it is very important to understand how dangerous prostitution, forced prostitution, and human trafficking all are. Um, if you break it down into the different things that are indeed um, dangerous. Let's talk medical first. Of course, um, the misconception is, is that prostitutes cannot be raped. A homeless person can't be raped because they're the lowest of the low in the eyes of society. Well, that's not true. Anybody has a voice and can say no. And a lot of people assume, well, I paid money, I can rape her. Well, um, you paying money for a sexual act is not a consent for rape, and that's important to to make the distinction in. Um, the other thing is is forced prostitution physically can have major medical implications, from making a person unable to have children to um, vaginal and anal tearing to um, causing massive STDs, HIV, and and other. Um, feminine as well as other medical issues for just the medical body itself, just the physical body itself. The emotional damage and the emotional dangerous um, conditions are stress, PTSD, um, paranoia, the need for um, a person to have to utilize some type of a substance to feel normal. When I was in the industry, there wasn't Backpage and all the smartphones and all this, but um, but now Backpage is, is a website, it's very similar to Craigslist, that um, it's known for the escort services and different things of that nature that, that are advertised on Backpage, and there's a lot of trafficking that goes on, even trafficking of, of minors, a lot of minors are advertised on Backpage, so we go on there and we just call the ladies and try to connect with, with them. And as I've said before, if, if we ever suspect any trafficking is occurring, of course, you know, we collaborate with other agencies that, that handle that. You know, our, our mission is not to have anyone arrested or, you know, nothing like that. We're, we're never going to um, have anyone arrested for prostitution or those sorts of things. Our, like I said, our, our job is to love and to encourage and support. So uh, when we call Backpage, we're, we're not trying to get anyone in any kind of trouble. We're genuinely calling to say, hey, is there anything you need? How can, how can we pray for you? And we just want to let you know that we exist because I know when I was in the industry, how isolated and alone I felt and like there was nowhere to turn. So that's, that's um, all. It's composed of, I think, almost 1,500 pictures of women who've been trafficked all throughout Texas on Backpage.com. And so not many people see them as innocent or daughters or young. And so this is kind of to say, you know what, you might not see their face this way, but someone needs to understand that they're somebody's daughter. It's somebody's daughter. Um, 
And so this was just kind of an artistic interpretation of that. <clears throat> this shows just kind of how Backpage is and how intensely graphic it can be. This girl is just playing completely, absolutely naked. Um, this is a pregnant woman. It says, expecting mother, don't miss out, you know. Um, and then these, this is a normal day on Houston Backpage, what it looks like. A lot of pixelation. You are welcome. Um, and then it talks also about how um, at the time of the 2008 federal bail bailout of Goldman Sachs, they were owning um, Village Voice Media, which owns Backpage. So at the time, that government bailout went to fund Backpage, which is selling underage girls. It is extremely important for law enforcement to not only be able to identify victims, but have some basic training as how to respond um, to victims of human trafficking and sex trafficking, sexual exploitation. Because this is the issue, too, is um, not only do they need to recognize them, but they need to know how to um, interview them. So let's say a raid happens at a brothel, and um, an officer interviews a girl and says, what's happened to you, what's happened here? Um, that testimony of what's happened to her will usually qualify her for legal rights and benefits through her process of getting out of that situation. So if an officer is very rude and, and says, what's happened to you? And they're like, nothing, I, I, I just wanted to be here, I'm a prostitute on my own. She's going to not access any of the excellent legislation that people have been working so hard to push through the system, especially with girls um, from different countries. Who they're having a translator. So if you if they don't have the understanding on how to say, hi, I'm a police officer, but I'm here to interview you. I want to help you. Um, make sure that you get in the right place. Um, tell me what's happened to you. You need to tell me everything that's happened to you so that I can make sure that you're taken care of. And so the way that they approach those girls is going to affect how we can help them. So they need to be completely educated on how to respond to them, how to talk to them. They need to deal with um, knowing that they're probably not going to like them because they've been manipulated to hate police officers, um, maybe because they were abused by either a police officer or a person dressed as a police officer. Um, they've been told by their pimp or trafficker that all they want to do is arrest them and get them in trouble. And so I think there needs to be not only an informational training, but even um, a psychological understanding of what it means to even talk to a sex trafficking victim. That it's not talking to someone that you may know that's thinking straight in a, in a straight way and that understands, oh, I need to defend myself for my rights. I need to make sure that I get what I need. And so it's, it's so very, very important. And unfortunately, we see a lot. Um, there's bias and different thought processes from one police officer to the next. And so when there's complacency with one police officer, that girl misses out on possibly getting access to a lot of resource and help because he didn't care to necessarily reach out to see if she needed that. And so any way we can train police officers to have compassion and to fully understand the situation and really take their own agendas and their own thoughts or frustrations um, out of the picture would just benefit, I think, the girls that are, up, that are caught up in the industry. My blood was on the walls. And, I mean, literally blood spatter was on the walls. And I left. And I, I told him then, I said, I'm done. I'm done. And so I tried to get out then, but it, right. between the ugly cycle with the drugs and all of that at that time, it was, and the guilt and the shame and everything, it was, was unable to escape. And so when she was um, about 18 months old, my mother um, adopted her. And I, at that point, I left again. I was just MIA again. With, back with him, actually. The last club that I actually worked at um, before I got out for good, I'd actually tried to get out of the industry twice um, before ending up here. The first time I was um, I was tired of, of traveling and um, so I came back to Oak Ridge, Knoxville area and you know, tried to work in in call centers and stuff, but um, it always seemed like there were just situations and circumstances that, that always led me back to the club. Um, my car would blow up, and it's always something with the, you know, the car. So, you know, your car blows up, and then you don't have a car. You can't afford to fix it. You don't have any savings. You don't have any family. You don't have any friends. You have nobody to borrow from. You don't have a car. You can't get to work. If you don't can't get to work, you can't pay your bills. You can't pay your bills. You can't pay rent, and you're out on your butt. And, you know, I had nowhere to go, so... 
when it came down to times like that, I, I always ended up back in the clubs time and time again. And um, it was the same situation. The last time I ended up here, I remember I, I came, um, I had to borrow a friend's car to get here. And I came to work and I remember I sat down in front of the mirror and I just cried and cried and cried because you just get to where you can't even look at yourself. You don't even know who you are anymore. And I just, I remember I called a friend from the dressing room and I just cried on the phone. I said, I don't, I can't do this. I don't, I don't know how to do this. You, you get to where you can't get high enough. You can't get drunk enough. You just. It takes to recover from sex trafficking. It's like two years. It's not a 28 day inpatient. See what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't give them the tool of 28 days and say, well, good luck. And why is that? Why, why is that? Because yeah. of the trauma that they are the suffering. If you're being sex trafficked, every time you have to have sex with someone, you are being raped. And a lot of the jobs are violent. Your pimps are violent. You could be being force-fed drugs and if you become so addicted, then the problem becomes, I'm not going to give you your drugs until you turn this trick for me. I mean, there's just a lot of different reasons and it's not like you can go into the ER and say I'm being sexually trafficked can you please help me well there's nowhere for you to go there's not some 28 day program or a year long program that they can just set you up insurance I can't even imagine if somebody said hey can we start having insurance pay for these victims of sex trafficking because they're going to need substance abuse mental health counseling somewhere to live and there's just all of those things that are happening at once and it's just not thought of yet as, you know, a problem. And now that society is getting more and more educated on what's really going on, and they're starting to finally reach out. Again, we've only really started looking at this problem in the United States for the last five years. So we've got a long way to go and a lot of educating to do. And unfortunately, usually the programs to help these people do not get the financial support they need because the government right now is not stepping up to help with that. It's all private donations and grants. Okay, so let me give you some numbers that I know. Okay. All right, because I've, I've had some interns for Wellhouse do some research. There's about 300 beds in the United States that are specific for women victims of trafficking. There's about 2,000 beds available through other types of shelters and services, but 300 specific. Wellhouse has 24 of those because we can house up to 24 women. We have to, there's one shelter in the United States that takes women with children. The barrier to services, even when we try to transfer ladies to, they may want like drug treatment or something like that. We are developing better relationships and helping other agencies understand more, but for more, many, many times, I've been told no, we will not take her. And that's, that's the thing is people have these misconceptions of what, number one, what a trafficker looks like. It's not the, uh, <laughs> it's not with the, the platforms and the jerry curl, with the jerry curl juice running everywhere and the big hat and the funky looking suits. It's, it could be the boy next door. He's helping recruit. And I mean, they have recruits all through high schools, middle schools. And, oh girl, I know how you can make some extra money. You know, they befriend them. They're, they're not just always just snatched up off the streets, and, and that's, a, that's a huge misconception. On the radio show, I can't tell you how many times survivors are sharing their stories, and it was somebody that they know, family member, cousin, a girl that has befriended, uh, befriended her and said, oh, well, I, I, this is what I do for a living. You know, they slowly bring them into it. She sees the money that's coming in, and she might be working for an escort service. It, it, it's not always a stranger that just comes and snatches somebody up. One of the things that I think is so important is how we're raising our children. Um, I know I come from a very abusive household and it affected how I thought of myself and how I saw myself. And I didn't have anybody in the schools that um, was able to um, change the way I thought about myself and help to build up my self-esteem. It just seemed like everything was tearing me down, tearing me down, tearing me down. As a child, what they get 
in their childhood, they take with them up to adulthood unless there are mentors or positive role models or something positive in their life um, to help to change the way they see themselves, change their perceptions of themselves. Um, I know for me, if I would have had that positive role model that said, no, Kelly, you're not worthless. No, you're not a piece of garbage. No, you're not whatever the negative thing was. But we see that so much in our society. And parents, um, it's so important for us to nurture our children. Because if not, they're going to be just easy targets, easy prey for these traffickers. I, and I, I hear it even in our ch church youth. Um, the brokenness and the pain that our, our youth is going through, whether it's a divorce, um, whether there's abuse in the home, um, whether they're being bullied, whatever it is, it's affecting them. And so we need to become more aware of what's happening with our kids and talking to our kids. We just have to be open and honest with them and let them know, hey, you are special. There are people out there that will hurt you. That we just have to have that conversation and educate our youth um, about what's happening on the internet how these targeters are, uh, traffickers are targeting our children. They're easy prey. They put on Facebook, I hate my mom. Next thing you know, they're getting a private message. Oh, let me help you. I'm so sorry you're going through that. They, traffickers feed into whatever that person needs. So if that person is talking about how they're struggling with their parents, that, that trafficker knows okay let me be that parent for them let me fill those shoes if this person if this young person is dealing with wanting more money because they're poor let me shower them with gifts let me let me do this for them let me take her to get her nails done let me take her to get her hair done let me buy her some clothes and that's how they lead them in because once you start feeding that need that young person is going to trust that trafficker. And so as, as mothers, as fathers, as grandparents, as aunts, uncles, youth leaders, um, mentors, we have got to start really feeding the positive in our children and our grandchildren. Because if not, they're going to be just easy targets. I was such an easy target. I had a, I swear I had a stamp on my head. Please just love me. I am begging somebody to love me. And that's why I always ended up in the situations that I ended up in because I craved it so much. And so parents, please, please, please edify your kids. Lift them up. Stop tearing them down. Stop telling them what they can't do. If you've grown up in a situation that's been um, domestic violence, full of violence, full of, you know, poverty, whatever, you can change that in your kids. You can tell them you can be whatever you want to be. You can be the president if you want it. So we have to start speaking into our kids' lives in a different manner and start treating them better. If not, their lives are, they're, they're done for. Society is going to get them. This is going to be turned into a transitional housing facility for rescue victims of human trafficking. The building was donated to us, um, to our refuge Memphis, so that we can use it for that purpose. In order for this problem to be even us to make a dent in it, the purchasing of sex needs to be a felony and he needs to be a registered sex offender. Because based on, on the low amount of recidivism with the John schools, what that says is if several men across the United States that have power and influence, because they're the ones that are purchasing sex, 
had to be a registered sex offender and had a felony on their record, then other men would be deterred. This is economics. This is basic supply and demand. Do I think the pimp needs to be arrested? Yes, possibly. Not her. And prostitution doesn't need to be legal, nor does adult entertainment or porn art. None of that needs to be legal. It needs to, all of it needs to be abolished. But we've got to go after the demand. Everybody calls us the church ladies. Hey, there are far worse things to be called. Hey, right? Very true. And we're okay with that. It's pretty cool. I mean, none of us even go to the same church. We're, you know, all from different churches, actually. But, and that's one thing, too. Like, people are always like, what, you don't take tracts or hand out Bibles or scriptures or preach or, you know, all that, talk, talk about Jesus. Well, I mean, yeah, we talk about Jesus if they, you know, they'll bring it up or... It just comes up, but we don't have to go in there preaching at them. They know, they know, we're, they call us the church ladies. They know. And people act like these girls in the clubs don't, like they don't know about Jesus. Or A lot of them, got, a lot of them go, go to church every Sunday. So, as was my mind, we don't have to, you know, talk about it. They know. <laughs> you know, like I said, you know, I've worked in clubs and I escorted and, and different things, but I never worked on, I never worked on the streets. Um, but now we do outreach to the streets and it's things that you kind of just always saw in documentaries or movies or read about. And then I come out here and I'm like, crap, I'm really seeing this right in front of my face. Like it's, it's the craziest thing to sit there and, and watch a girl talk to a girl, hug her, hand her food, hygiene items, pray with her, you know, offer her help, a way out, and then to see her walk away and jump in, jump in the car with a complete stranger for five, ten dollars. Like, I can't even, I can't even put that into words. There's one girl that, um, just, is just always in the forefront of my mind. Um, she's only 19. And she's a beautiful girl. She's um, she's on drugs and she's homeless. And when I see her, it just blows my mind. She, she's walking around down here and she's um, she's like always in flip-flops, men's boxers, and like a sheer undershirt. Like she's walking around in, in underwear, like no clothes or panties bra and um, her feet are always covered and just black, like her feet are black from just grime and dirt. And it just, it's so strange to me. And, and what, and what trips me out even more than seeing all this is I'm seeing it in broad daylight. And I remember one time we're, we're on outreach and we're talking, we're stalking with these, these, stalking with these women that are out working on the streets and right to my right, I'm seeing all the you know, everyone going into the, the church for a evening service, and wow, you know, it's right there in our faces, and the thing is, you know, sex trafficking has so many different faces, and every woman's story is so different and so unique, but a lot of these women that are out on the streets, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, this is just their choice, or you know, not everyone has made a choice <laughs> for this life. There's so many women out here that are being, you know, turned out by tricks. And so the massage parlors, um, that how we find those is um, sometimes uh, we just get word of mouth from, from people who know things. And other times we also, we find them on, on Backpage. And um, when you go on there and set up as a massage parlor, but yet there's images of women in lingerie, you kind of, you kind of get the picture, and then a lot of times, too, we'll kind of go, you know, scope the place out beforehand, and the places are always, um, you know, they're always pretty shady looking, you know, they've always got, um, I don't know what it is, but it's like they always have, like, blankets completely blacking out the windows, and, um, They always have crazy hours. Like they'll be just open like seven days a week from like 8 a.m. to midnight kind of thing. And the women are just always there. And another thing that's really crazy about a lot of these these types of massage parlors is um, the doors not open even during like regular 
business hours, it's always, it's just locked and you have, a lot of times you just have to knock. Some of them, they're unlocked, but a lot of them, they're, they're locked and, and you have to knock and then they, they let you in. And you can always tell, you know, when you show up because the, the women will, um, a lot of times they're dressed in lingerie or very skimpy clothing and they kind of just look at you, um, like when you're a woman and you're there, they kind of look at you like, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> and, um. You know, there'll always be um, men, just traffic of men coming and going like really quickly um, from these places. And, you know, I always see a lot of men's like work trucks and stuff um, parked outside. And then you go in too and they're just, they're set up so, so crazy on the inside there. Like they, they won't have a lot of the professional look and feel that a lot of places do. The only thing that's worked for me is when I met Jesus and I'm, I'm in professional counseling now. I have a discipleship team that I meet with weekly and I have pastoral counseling once a month. And that, that doesn't include the small group of friends I have that um, I can debrief with regularly. As a matter of fact, even after today and filming this, they'll be like, are you okay? Where are you? Where's your heart? You know? This is still a healing process. Oh, absolutely. And, and I'm, I can't not tell my story but it's still, there's a healing and a pain in it each and every time. Um, so when I met Lisa, she showed me what a Christian was. Not the hellfire and brimstone Jesus that I met as a child, but love and grace and mercy. And she just loved me. And my life changed. And I didn't even know I was a victim opening Wellhouse. In my mind, I was a prostitute, a whore, and a dope fiend. That's the only thing I'd ever known. That's the only thing I'd ever been told. Do you feel like that's the mindset of most? Absolutely. I was sitting at a conference reading the law, the TVPRA, um, which is the federal law. And I teach social welfare policy analysis at UAB. I was reading this law and I looked at the person sitting next to me and I said, based on this law, and that wasn't the first time I'd read it. I'd read it before, but the, my eyes opened. I said, based on this, I'm a victim. And I said, are you ready to deal with that? No, absolutely not. Because as long as I could take responsibility and I was a bad girl gone good, then life was okay. But looking at the fact that it was abuse and victimization, that took control out of my hands. But like I said, I told you earlier, God used my youngest daughter to show me. Because she's 15. She's the exact same age right now I was when I met my first pound. And she is so naive. And she's so smart. But her emotional ability to make that decision is not there. Her cognitive ability is not there. So what makes me think mine was? It wasn't. There was no choice. And that's one of the things I found across the board is it never, ever, 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 ever starts as an adult. Ever. So, well, I want to ask about the Oxmoor area. Um, kind of what's going to, first off, um, what's, that, what's going to happen tomorrow and what's, what's going to talk about tomorrow? Um, tomorrow night's a community event for people to come out and understand because they've seen our, um, posters up in the area. They know we've done some outreach in the area and I think the community there is wanting to understand, have more awareness on what's going on and with the trafficking in their area. She's 22 and married, and I got two grandbabies, one four and one two months. How often do you see them? They live with me. Oh, they her do? And my husband. Her, and, her and her husband. Yeah, see, like I say, I got to have family. I got to be doing something. I got, like, a, I had, before that house, I got, now I had, like, a four or five bedroom, two-story home. It was just me and my daughter. But I was taking in, you know, friends or my nieces I was raising. So I have to help. Like the house I got now, it was a lot of rooms. I'm like, well, I told my daughter, do your husband, y'all stay here and help me out. And, you know, I help y'all out and I can raise my, you know, help me and my grandbaby's life. Because I don't have a boyfriend, so I don't have, you know, I don't need no privacy. Yeah. <laughs> basically. That's basically what we do. Everything that we take, these gals, we just lavish them with love. We, everything's homemade, um, handcrafted that we make. Um, and we do um, restoration, which we have a Bible study. And support group, but we're also currently working towards 
being able to provide um, supportive transformational housing, which that's it's still in the works, but I'm telling you, it's coming because that's been the vision since I walked out of the, you know, since I left that industry. God gave me that vision almost 10 years ago, and things are are coming to pass now. And so um, we're working towards having housing, but at the very core of everything that we do, it's it's relationship, relationship with God, and relationship with others. It's about community, and that's why I don't intentionally try to be big on having fun. It's just who I am. But then when I think about it, it makes so much sense because I'm not going out trying to convert anybody, change anybody, tell them to leave, tell them they need to get. I mean, I'm trying. I'm sharing the hope that I found. Yes, but ultimately, I'm just saying, hey, come hang out, have a good time, and. I find that in those moments, discipleship happens naturally. 